Okay, so again, my name is Rudy Apozdag. Thanks for being here. Um, so if you look at over the tops content providers, you know, Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, and the others, um, the telcos are providing the infrastructure, right? They're providing the connectivity. They're connecting the users to the storage, compute, content. But really, the over-the-tops are reaping the benefits. Yet, they are using the same technology that is available to everybody, right? They're not, they're not you know, using alien technology, right? How are they doing that? And, and do the telcos really want to remain in the state where they're just essentially, you know, excuse me, what, dumb pipes, right? Because you know, you're really providing the connectivity. You're at a very critical point. You, you spend all that um, capex and opex to create the infrastructure to provide that connectivity. But, but there's something missing. Why are they not utilizing the same technology that's available to the over-the-tops? The over-the-tops the over the are really, you know, of course, they have an IT background. That's where they're coming from. Right. And they're able to, um, you know, they're the, the early adopters of virtualization, SDN, and to a degree, NFB. Um, and if, I'm sure that you've seen the slide before, but the, you know, the, the main message is that as, as consumers, we expect performance to grow all the time, but the price that we pay to not, and, and that's kind of a limiting factor in terms of revenue. Yet, the infrastructure costs to provide that uh, technology is increasing rapidly, so this is the business model for the system telcos is not really sustainable, right? So, and why? Well, because partly because the network elements, the network devices, are getting more and more complex to design, to acquire, to uh, getting more expensive to operationalize, train the staff, and provide the service. So, the the question is, what's what's the answer? Um, commoditization. Um, the, the, the large content providers, the over-the-tops, are using commoditization very well. And you cannot compete against them if you don't use the same technology. It's just it's very simple. And we see commoditization on the hardware side, right? You know, we started with custom hardware, and it was standard where you can you know, mix and match and it would still work. And then, of course, white box switches are very common now in the data center. Right? Um, and after white box, you also have bare metal. And in fact, it's not necessarily after. You know, we see white box switches common in the data center. We also have bare metal servers very common in the data center. Right? Vanity free, just only the components, the, the bare minimum components that you really need. But it doesn't really just apply to hardware. It's also applicable to software. Right? We start with proprietary software. And the reason, the, the motivation for innovation doesn't really go away, actually, because companies will still continue to innovate because they start out with proprietary devices or proprietary software that they still money, make money off of. But eventually, it does become a standard. Then you have the open source, and then you have the free. Now, remember that open source and free don't, are not always the same. Sometimes they are. I do use um, open office. It's free for me. But not all open source you know, uh, solutions are free. It does, it does cost, cost something. Um, OK. So how do we apply commodization and, and, and take advantage of it for the telcos? And then really, the answer partly is network function visualization. Right? If you think about the current uh, devices right now, they're vertically integrated devices. Right? And you know, they're very costly to develop, very costly to acquire, as I mentioned before. But if you think about it, you know, what is, a, what, what is inside these? It's a server or a bunch of servers or some custom ASICs running software wrapped in sheet metal. Well, if you look at a server, it's, it's a server that can run any software that's wrapped in sheet metal. So why don't we um, just take advantage of commonization, take advantage of common off-the-shelf servers uh, or components, stand high volume servers, networking, and storage, and run the same functions on this infrastructure the same way that the over-the-tops do, right? And that will actually help tremendously in both reducing the costs, but actually, you know, if I have time, I'll go over an example, help generate revenue. Um, so impact on telcos. Of course, um, following a very IT-centric model helps with agility, right? And that's one of the issues that we have with telcos in that uh, being able to provision services whenever and wherever they're needed. If you're running 
services as software on common inf infrastructures that are spread all over the place. It can be in a centralized data center, it can be in the pop, it could be a central office. Then you can actually move services and provision them wherever you want, and that's agility. Second thing is that, of course, reducing the service provisioning time from two months to two minutes helps you recuperate revenue. And once you're in the software model, you can actually roll out new services and create new avenues for revenue. And that's what over-the-tops do. I'm going to skip some of the slides. Uh, we have the cost, uh, you know, costs and, and revenue benefits, as I mentioned. Um, I'm going to be publishing a, a study on, on a business case for NFV. Um, we'll see that the initial capex savings is really not all that much because it does require uh, spending and a new model. But you'll see that the oper operational expenses <coughs> do uh, have a significant advantage with NFV. It uh, helps with reduced uh, truck rolls, right? Uh, using a common infrastructure with um, power consumption, cooling, cabling. There's all, all of these things that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in the study. Um, it also helps with revenue generation. Um, once you go through this model of having a common compute infrastructure, you know, you can provide, you, you all the, you know, you might be provisioning an Ethernet service for your customers. Now you can provision a managed firewall. So just bring up the software. Then a managed encryption, managed uh, WAN optimization. You know, once you actually start provisioning one service, provisioning the other services are very straightforward and easy. Um, I think John had mentioned about the centralized control. And if, if we spend a bit of time, a couple of minutes on the technical side, um, we have the connectivity that you see in the middle, and then we have our data centers. These can be centralized data centers. You know, think about the large data centers that you have with Facebook and Google, but you can also you know, think about converting POPs, central office, or even customer premises to very small micro data centers. Right? The idea is that you would have an intelligent controller that can control all the physical and virtual resources to quickly provision a service. Right? and take care of all the manageability, configurability, and life cycle of all these devices, and then terminate these when the service is no longer needed. Um, now, in reality, um, it's not really not just one controller. It has to be federated, federated and it has to be hierarchical in nature. Right? You have your packet optical. You have your IPLS network, IPMLS, MPLS network. You might have an open flow network and other networks. They might all come with their own NMSs or SDN controllers. You might use an SDN controller from a vendor or an open source. But the idea is that it has to be federated, it has to be hierarchical, and it has to be modular. Even if you get all the SDN controllers or of these, all of these controllers from one, one vendor, it is in your advantage for it to be modular because you can take advantage of the developments that happens at each single layer, right? So in, in this particular case, we use OpenStack for uh, cloud management systems, but you can use OpenStack, you can use VMware, and there's a new release of OpenStack every six months, right? You can take advantage of the advancements very quickly in a mo very modular nature. Um, you know, there's a number of consortiums that, uh, you know, uh, help with uh, the advancement of these technologies and uh, particularly operationalization. I just want to go over one simple example, which is the Etsy. Um, so um, Etsy is a user-led or operator-led group uh, where they want to create a framework for network furniture virtualization. Right? So at the bottom, you have your common infrastructure, standard high-volume servers, compute and storage. Then you have your virtualization layer. Think about your Linux. If you, take, if you combine the virtualization layer with the virtual network function manager, or sorry, uh, the virtualized infrastructure manager, that's your VMware or OpenStack or your cloud stack. Um, you have your virtual network functions, your, your virtual router, uh, virtual firewall, virtual encryption, and they might have their EMSs. But, the, but even, you know, I'm talking about a lot of components, but the, the important thing is that, is that the orchestrator is really the linchpin technology that ties in with the OSS, that takes the order, and then orchestrates all of these resources. And what I mean by orchestrates is that, how do you onboard a virtual firewall? How many virtual machines are in a virtual firewall? In which sequence do they come up? How do you allocate the necessary compute uh, uh, resources? How do you scale it? How do you provide high availability? What happens in, if, there's a, if you need, say, uh, say, failover? How do you spread some of these um, services across multiple data centers. And once the service is no longer needed, how do you 
retrieve those resources and give it back to the data center. This is what the orchestration really uh, uh, does. So um, it's 10. Use case, the slides will be available to you. I'm going to be here uh, so I can talk more to it. Um, John is, is, is stopping me, so uh, well, thank you very much.